Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's, you know, it's no secret we're celebrating our parish anniversary. We've been uh, having a lot of fun in terms of creating a lot of different content and opportunities for formation uh, and all the dimensions of our faith life, spiritual as well as theological and pastoral, intellectual. Uh, so we're gifted tonight. I know when we when we arrived here, one of the, the things that was a great desire for a lot of the parishioners was ongoing theological formation. I know that was always a great part of this parish's legacy and certainly something that we, we hope to continue. We had a, a series on the Eucharist back in January, uh, and Bishop Anjay was here for one of those presentations, and we're happy to have him back here uh, this evening. So the motivation and the, the sort of idea, the inspiration behind this theme, this particular theme uh, of the Second Vatican Council is anything but random. Uh, if you've seen our, our kind of promotional material on social media, next month marks the 60th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council. And as the church is now 60 years on, I think this is a great opportunity for us to, to look back, certainly, at not only what's gone on the past 60 years, but to return to the original sources uh, and the documents themselves, but also to position that uh, with where we are in this particular moment uh, as a church and as a society, as a world. Uh, and I know Bishop Anjay will speak on that in a moment. So with that in mind, uh, I want to go right back to the beginning. Uh, on October 11th, 1962, all of the bishops around the world uh, met at St. Peter's Basilica, and that was the first session of the first, what would be over four years of, of meetings. And Pope John XXIII addressed all of the bishops gathered there, and he concluded his remarks with a prayer for divine assistance. So while the language of this prayer might be sort of tailored to the current events that occurred 60 years ago, as I was praying this prayer, I was thinking about how the Holy Spirit is continuing to move through the church at this particular moment. So mindful of both the history and the, the manner in which John the 23rd opened the council, and mindful of where we are as a church now, I invite us all to place ourselves in God's presence as we hear this prayer that opened up the Second Vatican Council. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, we have no confidence in our own strength. All our trust is in you. Graciously look down on these pastors of your church. Aid their councils and their legislation with the light of your divine grace. Be pleased to hear the prayers we offer you, united in faith, in voice, in mind. Mary, help of Christians, help of bishops, Recently in your church at Loretto, where we venerated the mystery of the Incarnation, you gave us a special token of your love. Prosper now this work of ours, and by your kindly aid, bring it to a happy, successful conclusion. And do you, with St. Joseph, your spouse, the holy apostles Peter and Paul, St. John the Baptist, and St. John the Evangelist, intercede for us before the throne of God. To Jesus Christ, our most loving Redeemer, the immortal King of all peoples and all ages, be love, power, and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It's my great joy to welcome Bishop Andrzej Smyszewski. Oh. Brother John. Thank you, Father John. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. So I don't have to use the microphone, do I? If, you will, if, if my voice will be fading, just raise the hand, all right? But I hope not. Uh, that's wonderful. Uh, great, great to be with you, of course. And, and, and I have to tell you, whatever you are going to learn, uh, whatever you are going to learn, I'm so glad to talk to you about the first document that was the fruit of the deliberations of the, of the fathers of the council. Uh, this document was on liturgy. Uh, so it just shows you that, 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 that very, very important was at the Vatican Second Council to reform the liturgy, and, and it was really the core and, and the biggest desire uh, to, uh, to, to sit down and, and lay down the foundation, spiritual, pastoral, and theological foundation for uh, Eucharistic renewal. 
and and uh, it was the first document actually next year uh, uh, December 4th we are going to celebrate the anniversary of, of this document and uh, and I hope that that definitely in the United States we are going to uh, talk more about this uh, listen whatever you are going to learn and I hope you are going to have fantastic uh, teachers here and fantastic presenters I'm so glad to tell you because it's all boils down to the Eucharist this is the most important topic. Uh, of course, I've been not able to tell you everything. I will definitely give the outline of the document, and I would like to place the importance of this document right now in, in the current, in the current uh, uh, kind of pastoral work of the church, starting with the synod, as you know, because we are still in the midst of the synod. We finish our kind of... Uh, a local uh, deliberations and the report was already sent uh, from uh, the United States. Our continental report already went to Rome. You'll be able to see both documents and our diocesan one and continental online, if it's not already, but if not, it's going to be available definitely sometime soon or maybe even this week. Uh, so you will see it, uh, but uh, the, cons the synod is still going on. As you know, uh, the, the, the fathers of the church are going to meet in Rome next fall, exactly at the anniversary of the, uh, of the, of the Sacrosanctum Concilium, the document, the document on, on, on the liturgy, uh, which is going to be a wonderful mark. Uh, but also, as you know, uh, in the United States, uh, starting already with the feast of the, of the Corpus Christi, we began our Eucharistic revival. Eucharistic Revival. I am very excited about this. Eucharistic Revival, this is something that is so American, but I will tell you what is so interesting. That, that with this Eucharistic Revival, not too many people know about this, but you are going to know today how lucky you are. <laughs> that the Holy Father Francis issued a beautiful document. Kind of, you know, I was like, whoa, if he's, if he's taking, probably taking a notes from our American church, and the title of this document is Desiderio Desideravi about the Eucharistic Reform. So I'm going to give a nice, beautiful overview. I'm going to like really paint for you a beautiful map where we are with all this that is happening right now in the church, including this Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is, believe it or not, still is. You will hear me probably saying this few times. Sacrosanctum Concilium and all the constitutions that you are going to actually study, and you will hear about this, and I would strongly encourage you to go online. Everything is online. You'll be able to read all those constitutions online. Listen to this. They are all still the blueprint, the blueprint of all the reforms. Everything what happened in the church after the Second Vatican Council, listen to this. Everything what will happen in the future with any kind of reform, even reform of the liturgy, reform of the pastoral life, uh, reform uh, of our parishes, has already its own blueprint with those documents, with constitutions. They will never go against, even new constitutions will never go against the previous one, so the ones that we have right now. So I think already hearing about this and what this reform or what this constitution was all about on liturgy uh, is already uh, it's good to know because you know we can you can even use this as a point of reference. <laughs> you know, people uh, people people even sometimes you know write to me or ask me, oh my God, why we hear so much about the you know Latin chants or even using the Latin for uh, for some parts of the mass. Well, because this document I'm talking about, you know, opened that door. Uh, we cannot really, as you know, totally uh, kind of drop Latin from our liturgy for many, many reasons. As you know, this is the language of the church. There is some, some, certain kind of, you know, mystery that this language provides, but I will tell you this. Uh, you know, we are becoming more and more universal church. More and more universal church. What a pleasure people have who can go, for example, to Rome, or I rem I am in Poland, listen, I am in Poland for the World Youth Day, to, when was that, well, how many years ago, uh, three years ago, no, even, yeah, three years ago. 
I'm in Poland <laughs> celebrating the Mass with so many international groups, and I am in my own cathedral, and they give me a Roman, uh, I mean, Latin missal to say the parts of the Mass. You know, because, uh, and how beautiful that is. People may come from different parts of the world. Uh, you know, as you know, Engli English is not the only language that we use in the world. Uh, more and more we learn about Spanish. But how beautiful is that is that we Catholics, you know, can use the same language, like Latin, to say the parts that we are familiar with, like our father, you know, like, like, uh, like uh, Creed, uh, like even Agnus Dei or Sanctus Sanctus. See, those parts are really, you know, that doesn't have, we don't have to use this, you know, all the time, but it's good to have them because it's a really learning experience and really makes us to feel that we are the parts of Universal Church. And if you will all go on, on pilgrimages right now, like my secretary came from Portugal, from Lourdes and, and, and Fatima, and if you go to Rome, you will see that many masses uses, use those Latin, Latin prayers just for us to feel a universal. Uh, all together, but as you can see, when people complain, well, read those documents, and you will see that that this document already makes room and lies foundation, for example, for aspects like this. So, let me just tell you about very briefly where we are with the synod. Let me tell you very briefly where we are right now with our national United States Eucharistic revival. Uh, mind you, to say we have three years to go three years to go, so each year has like another level, another element, so you're going to hear more and more and more about this, and this is my job, and I will encourage every parish, so I'm so glad and very proud of Father John that he's already so in tune and introduces to you or pushes this whole big machine of the Eucharist for us to be, uh, to be uh, more involved and, and understand even more. Uh, because, I mean, for, because many, many, for many, many reasons. Less than 20% Catholics go to the church every Sunday. And, you know, if you are talking about those, that 20%, I was giving a talk to a pastor out. He says, Bishop, who are you kidding? In my parish, are you ready? 4% of Catholics in his parish go to the church every Sunday. Four. So listen to this. We also learn, it's very, very interesting. And let me just tell you what happened, because a year ago, a few studies also revealed that out of those going to the church every Sunday, 60%, actually 65%, do not believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Do not believe. Those who go to the church every Sunday do not believe. But listen to this. Even those researchers, most recently, because I have received the letter they sent to all the bishops, probably to tell you guys, they apologize for making a mistake that the questions asking people about the, about the real presence of Christ were not accurately phrased because how you can ask people about the real presence if they don't even understand what the real presence is? You know what I'm saying? Do you feel the confusion? We, you know, we need to, we need to, we need to update ourselves, upgrade ourselves, on so many things. Because you know, language of theology changes, language of the church changes. As you know, as you know, missal, Roman missal, the, the book that we use for the mass, changed already. It was updated three times. Three times the responses: "The Lord be with you and with your spirit." Remember for how long we said, "And also with you." And we change that now. So look at this, three times already changed. And, and listen, how about this? 30 years ago, if you were 30, 40, I'm sure you, you probably helped me because you're involved with, 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 with bereavements. 30 years ago, 40, if you will come and bring the ashes to the church, pastor would not even know what to do with those ashes, right? It was kind of even forbidden to, 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 to cremate. Cremation was, was not, it changed. It changes. Theology changes. Uses different language, different understanding. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is why it is so important for us to update our files. How many of you have a computer? <laughs> Listen to this. What will happen to your computer if you will skip like three or four updates? <laughs> Throw it out through the window, right? Yes. 
And I'm talking already about three updates with the Roman Missal, three updates. If you don't update your computer, it's useless. Am I right? Am I right? You remember, you know, I, I was learning how to use the computer on, 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 on Windows and IBM, blah, blah, blah. You remember what happened? I mean, you will not be even able to turn this on if you will not kind of um, format the disk. You hear me? You remember about formatting the disk? You have to format the hard drive to use it? You hear me? You remember those words? Oh, please help me. Do you? Yes. You hear the word I said? Form. Formation is very important. Our spiritual formation is very important. Our pastoral formation is very important. Our theological formation is very important because without this, we are lost. You follow me? I guess not. You follow me? Yes. Don't leave me alone, please, you know. I don't want you to fall asleep because we don't have espresso here today. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't want to really bore you or, or put you to sleep with the whole thing. But you probably heard my story. I don't know who was here. I'm not sure if I used the story. But, you know, years ago, I had really very good experience. Of, of arrogantly telling my friend who is a priest in, in Brussels and we were traveling to Munich and I was in Munich so many times. Listen, I'm going to be your guide. We stopped by in travel agency. Travel agency in Brussels gave us a beautiful map of Munich. We are all set. Listen to this. We, we are all of a sudden, I'm right uh, some down, somewhere downtown of Munich, maybe a little bit off, but looking at the maps like, you know, just, my God, what is here on this map and what is there? There are two different stories. This entrance is not even here. Uh, this park is not even here. I mean, we were so lost. And holy smoke, we are just, we, we need to find our hotel. And guess what? There is, I, mean, I don't see our hotel. You cannot go, as you know, when you travel, go to uh, whatever hotel because they will tell you, oh, don't look for this hotel. We have room for you, right? No, 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 no. I need this hotel. So it took us a while. Uh, here we go. We are already three hours behind the schedule, finally finding our hotel. I'm looking at this map they gave us in Brussels. Would you believe that she gave us the map of Munich, which was 18 years old? <laughs> I don't have to tell you what happens to the people if you are going to use old maps. Hello, you are? Lost. lost. Do you understand why so many Catholics are lost in the church right now? Their maps are not updated. I'm sorry. Maps are not updated. That's why they travel in the church and they hear all those different talks. What is the real presence? What the heck is the real presence? Tell me, he's really present. He's really present. I will give you a, 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 you know, a perfect example, and you know, John knows this, or you know, how many of you are Eucharistic ministers? Look at this. And I'm not going to ask you about your practices. Let me just tell you the way I see it. Is that okay? Will you allow me to? Yes. You go to the Blessed Sacrament, and your job is to take those, the, the, the Eucharist, the Eucharist, and bring this to the altar because Father asks you to bring it from the, you know, from, from the tabernacle. You go to the tabernacle, the door is closed, and now you know that you have to give a reference, reverence to the tabernacle, right? Would you do this before opening the door to the tabernacle or after opening the door to the tabernacle? How many of you will say before? Thank you. How many of you will say after? Before and after. Before and after. I'm sorry? Before and after. Before and after. Before and after, both? Yes. Oh, oh that, that's smart. <laughs> that's smart. You don't have to do twice. Let's do this once. So you will do this before or after? Ah, look at this. Look at this. And this is the whole thing. How many times I watch the Mass in the cathedral, and each time you can see people, even Eucharistic minister, doing different things. Look at this, how beautiful, how, beautiful, how beautiful theology is. Would you say hello 
to your friend coming to visit you with a closed door or open doors? What is in the tabernacle is not a box of holy cookies. <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is the point. A real person, re real Jesus is there. And reverence is saying hello to Jesus. Why then would you say hello to Jesus with the doors closed? Think about this. Really? Come, open the door. Good morning, Jesus. <laughs> Does this make sense? Yes. Does this make sense? Yes. Use your heart. Theology is very beautiful. You know, if you will only understand. The same thing, closing. You know, would you, would you then genuflect or give a reference after closing the door or before closing the door? Do you say goodbye to your friend with a closed door or open door? Open. Merry Christmas. <laughs> bow, bow and give a reference to the open tabernacle. Have a nice day, Jesus, and then close the door. How do you like that? How do you like that? Follow your heart. Because, big question, who do you serve? The box of holy cookies or... A living Christ. See what do we need this reform? Yes. We need to wake up. We need to we need to retrain ourselves again on the importance of this. So welcome to the Eucharistic revival. We need to revive ourselves <coughs> Eucharistically. To understand what we are doing and this way will be more exciting. You know, my, my classic story and the story that I like the most is about, my God, you know, thank God you didn't invite me to talk about Road to Emmaus, but if you ever will, oh my God, will I take you on the right? Were not our hearts pounding inside of us when, they rec when we recognize him, when he explained the scripture to us, when he also broke the bread and gave it to us? Were not, they asked themselves, were not our hearts pounding? See, to me, the pounding heart is like, do you remember the time what you fell and your pounding heart when you fall in love or when you kiss your girlfriend for the first time? I see you smiling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you must remember, tick, 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 tick. If not, please fall in love again to, see, to, to understand what I'm talking about. If we can only make the same kind of miracle and help people to leave the church every Sunday with a pounding heart, listening to the scripture, sharing the bread and receiving, and going home saying, wow, wow. It's possible. Welcome to the Eurocast Revival. That is the goal of the revival. Let us revive ourselves once again. Let's relieve this beautiful mystery of Christ who is sharing this beautiful gift with us. So, as you know, Synod has to do something with this. We started already in 2021. Synod is going to end next year in the fall of 2023. Uh, I have to tell you, altogether from our diocese, I read a thousand pages of the reports. A thousand pages. I cannot even tell you how many of them were people looking for, let's do something with the mass. Let's attract young people with the mass. I want to understand more about the mass because this is the core. You know, I, uh, one day, you, you remember Jim Lisante, Monsignor Lisante, one, he, one day he overbooked himself for, for uh, which is not unusual, uh, overbooked himself with being a chaplain on the cruise, so he asked me to go on the cruise for him. What a painful job that is, I have to tell you. <laughs> so I was on nine days uh, Southern Caribbean cruise, and I don't know how the heck I'm going to do it, but I had a really beautiful time. I was a Catholic chaplain, 
that was with me also, a Protestant chaplain who came with his son. His wife just died, so he took his son on a, a nice, beautiful, uh, you know, cruise just to get his mind out. One day, this boy is asking him about God. And I'm like kind of listening to the conversation. We're standing next to each other. Uh, Daddy, Daddy, like, how big is God? How big is God? And, and the chaplain was clever because he said, do you see this cloudless sky? God is even taller than that. Wow. He said, do you, see, do you see the floor of the ocean? He said, no, I don't. But you don't see it because it's that deep. God is even deeper than that. Do you see this horizon to your light and to your left? God is even wider than that. And you know what the little kid said? Jesus was so right. If you will not become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow, Daddy, God is as big as sky, deep as an ocean, and as wide as the horizon, and we are right here in the middle of that. Bang, we are right in the middle of that. That's what the Eucharist is. Whatever you will learn, and you will hear fantastic speakers, theologians that will take you, whoa, very high in theology. I hope that you are going to have presenters who will be so deep, as deep as the ocean. You are going to learn uh, uh, so many things, and it's going to be as wide as the horizon. Eucharist, it's right in the middle of this. Eucharist is exactly the center. The center. And you and I are right in the middle of it. And that's what this document, Sacrosanctum Concilium, it's all about. So, you know, after, after this, uh, uh, as you can see from 2022, 2025, for the next three years, we are going to have here in the United States Eucharistic Revival. What is the Eucharistic Revival is going to be about? It's going to be on the mission of the renewed church by enkindling a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. Uh, enkindling, so like enlightening a living relationship. Listen, a living relationship. So think about this. A living relationship you cannot have just with a thing, with a material thing. A living relationship is between persons. And this is why it already tells you that we'll be looking for this Jesus that is fully alive. So the vision of that is to have a movement of Catholics across the states healed, converted, formed, and unified by an encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist and sent out in a mission for the life of the world. Beautiful. We have three years to do that. What well, does that mean that, look at this, right now we are in this phase, because this was a preparation we have celebrated on the June 19 Corpus Christi, now from Corpus Christi to next Corpus Christi, to next year, we are going to have a diocesan Eucharistic revival. Please pray for me and feel very bad for me, because I am responsible right now to, uh, to prepare a programs and for priests and for deacons and for the people in the chancery, including Bishop Barres. I'm trying to convert him. I'm kidding. <laughs> but, you know, we are preparing. We are preparing the teams, parish teams. We will be preparing parish staff. So, so listen to this. Please don't... Uh, so, starting next, Corpus Christi, in every parish in our diocese, we are going to have, this is the diocesan part, a parish revival. A parish revival. All folks and groups in the parish, from children to adults, from the first pew till the very last pew, or those even without the pews, which means they are skipping the Sunday Mass. We'll find a way to reach out to them, folks. We are going to have incredible programs, live programs available online. I mean, you name it. 
they are already available, you are coming, you are going to hear more about this, and I hope that with the direction of Father John, you are going to continue at this beautiful revival among ourselves. Because to me, adult faith formation, which is kind of struggling here in our diocese and in every diocese, needs also to be revived because education of children, our children without educating adults, it's not working. It's not working. We need to, edu- we need to update our files to become witnesses. So look at what happened. In 2024, in the United States in July, because as you can see, I'm sorry, it's July 17. You see this? July 17, 2024. We are going to have in the United States a National Eucharistic Congress a National Eucharistic Congress in July. It's going to be in Indianapolis. United States Bishops' Conference is already preparing the event for, are you ready? 100,000 participants. 100,000 participants. Bishops, priests, the Holy Father is going to be invited too. If you will make it, we don't know. It's going to be invited. Hopefully, a lot of people are going to come from Rome. We're going to have guests from Europe, from all over the place. But listen to this. Also from our diocese, we are going to have delegates to go for this Eucharistic Congress and be prepared, be prepared because the whole Congress is going to be for a week, be prepared to become a missionaries, Eucharistic missionaries. So after the Congress in July 17 of 2024, they will be sent back to the diocese to be missionaries of the Eucharistic revival. So it's going to be ongoing process. So formally, as you know, it is going to be ended in 2025, which is the feast, will be the feast of the Pentecost on June 8, but the work will continue. How exciting is that? I cannot tell you when, because I don't know, but we are going to have also a Eucharistic Congress, diocesan one here in our diocese. You may remember that the last one we had in Our Lady of the Island. Remember that one? And so this is going to something totally new. Uh, I'm not sure. We may even have prior to this Congress, but we don't want to congest this. We may even have this, (coughs) excuse me, sometimes after. I'm being very realistic right right now. We probably may have our diocesan one once again, exactly around this time, 2025, to set ourselves in our diocese and a new, new Eucharistic kind of life. But things may change. Please don't, don't, don't quote me right now, but, but, but that's what it is. Okay? So that's where we are right now at the map. Let me just tell you more about this, about this blueprint that we have right now, because it's very, very good to start with the ground. And the Sacrosanctum Concilium, as you can see, it's a Latin term. Uh, a, a holy concilium. Uh, uh, every document starts with the first word, words of the document. Uh, it's the first document published here. Look at this already on December 4th. So council, as Father John already mentioned, look at this, how many bishops gathered in Rome in October of 1962, only a year later. That's a very, very quickly for constitution like this. We have a beautiful, beautiful document which is called Sacrosanctum Concilium. Look at this. I'm just giving you already a very nice, beautiful overview because for a while I would like to go uh, deeper with certain aspects of this. Seven major, major chapters of this document. Today I would like to just simply cover very briefly this one, two, three, because I don't have a time and as you can see I can talk. But I don't want to keep you the whole night here. I would like to basically give you a nice, beautiful ground of this tree, encourage you to read more if you would like to, because the rest of them will be about breviary, about the office that we have uh, and priests are using and religious using, but parishes can also use, about the meaning of liturgical year, which is also a big reform, about the sacred music and the sacred art. Those things I would like to... Uh, to maybe like kind of uh, uh, skip this because I think these first three are, are truly very, very important because they really gives us an essence. And, you know, in so many ways, we, we, we forgot about this. We just simply didn't pay attention to this. 
But look at this. Already in this general principles, what I find is very interesting. Here you will have a quotes exactly from these documents, certain sentences that I just simply pull out to help us to reflect on something what is very important. Mass allows us to participate in the Paschal mystery of Jesus Christ, passion, death, and resurrection, ascension of Christ present in the liturgy. Wow. Paschal mystery. Let me tell you something. If we will not understand that from the time of our baptism, we are kind of being plunged into the Paschal mystery of Christ, if we are going to totally ignore what the council is telling us about, we will never grasp the liturgy or never grasp the gift of the Eucharist. Paschal mystery, which means Thursday, Friday, I mean, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday, a time between Easter and, and Ascension of the Lord uh, and Pentecost all together. You follow me? That's the Paschal mystery. You follow me, right? During the Mass, we celebrate all of them together, bang, in one event. In one hour, bang, the whole Paschal mystery we celebrate. But I will tell you why this mystery is so very important. And I think that you'll be, you will hear this, believe me, you will hear so many talks and so many documents bringing back our awareness that we are plunged and we participate in the Paschal mystery of Christ, which means, listen, you know, I'm sorry, you were baptized, yes, so you have already a mark of the Paschal mystery in you. Wait, 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 wait. So, yes, you are already plunged into the suffering of Christ, because is there still a suffering in the world? It is Christ who suffers in them. You hear me? I don't want to sound arrogant when, when people say, Father, Father, uh, you know, why do I suffer? You know, I am a nice girl. I go to the church every Sunday. I do everything by the Lord, you know, with the Lord. Why do? How many innocent people suffer? You follow me? If I will be not a priest, I will tell you, oh my God, you know what? I really don't know. I'm sorry. What can I? But you know what? A theologian, a theologian who already just told you about the Paschal mystery, don't throw, the, the, don't throw the chairs at me, okay? But listen to what I will tell you. When people ask me, Father, what do I suffer? Why not? It is Christ who suffers in us. You know what I'm saying? Oh, so, you know, who did and who, so why then we are baptized? Well, listen, if you suffer, if you have a good Friday of your life, you hear me? When you carry your cross, you hear me? You have the promise of the Easter Sunday. You have the promise of the resurrection all at once. You know what I'm saying? You hear me? If you cry right now, you have a promise of the, 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 the Christ right now to change and turn into a smile. Turn into the Easter Sunday. You have already all at once. Every single pain and suffering of Christians, though who belongs to Christ, already contains the promise of eternal life. Wow. Wow. That's how important is this. But my point is, look at this. Do we suffer sometimes? And I'm even talking about the suffering, physical suffering. How about emotional suffering? Spiritual suffering? We all do, don't we? It is Christ who suffers in us. So which means we have Good Fridays. Right? We have Good Fridays. We have Good Fridays. I will tell you what, I have done, I, ha I did spiritual direction to so many people. You know what is the beautiful spiritual direction? That when you talk to the people, what's happening in their lives, I will be able to tell you where you are right now in the Paschal mystery. Where is your Holy Saturday? How many times in your life you were sitting, drinking your coffee or sipping a nice drink like scotch and Dirac, and you were wondering, what the heck is going on in my life? Did you have those moments in your life? Did you? Yes. I hear all of you saying yes. yes. Listen to this. On Holy Saturday, 
When Jesus died, I can tell you this right now, they were all sitting in the lock room, as you know, and they were talking, what the hell just happened? What? You remember the story to Emmaus? They were walking to Emmaus, and what they were talking, what the hell just happened? Which means you and I, in those moments when we ask ourselves, what the heck is going This is our Holy Saturday. You hear me? Do you see this, that Paschal mystery is happening in our lives? Oh, my God. If we were just simply able to embrace a Paschal mystery in our life, which we, notabene, celebrate already in the Eucharist, oh, my God, guess what? Eucharist is our life. What is going on every Sunday, it's the key to my life. It's the code to my life. My God. If we will only embrace, and each one of us will have a different story, ladies and gentlemen, Paschal mystery is exactly the way to go, and ba-boom, already from the very beginning. Sacrosanctum Concilium reminds us that from the time of our baptism, we celebrate our Paschal mystery. Christ's love flows to us in a very special way from the Eucharist and the whole world. It flows. It is the center as the uh, uh, water and blood flow from his side, the grace of baptism, the grace of the Eucharist, it was also given to us. How Christ is present to us in the church celebrating the... Look at this. You have already here five very important places, and this is the gift of the Sacred Sanctum Concilium reminding us where and how Christ is really present. In the church celebrating the Eucharist, church at prayer, basically. He is present in the sacrifice of this Mass. This is another very important thing. All of a sudden, people question, oh, you know, I remember, I remember uh, people writing to me emails and letters, oh, I don't understand why he needs to be educated and stop telling us that, that, that the Mass that we are celebrating here is the sacrifice. I'm sorry, but Father is right. Sunday Mass is a sacrifice. That's why we have the altar. Why would you have the altar for? It is the altar of the sacrifice. Now, all of a sudden, in our dialogue, ecumenical dialogue, we want to forget about the Mass. No, no, no. Mass is a sacrifice. Mass is a sacrifice. We stop talking. Listen to this. We stop talking about Mass as a sacrifice, and look what happened. People don't make sacrifices even for their children to come to the church on Sunday. Or would you sacrifice for other people? Well, you just heard the story about the rich man and Lazarus. And here we go. Here we go. The rich man from the gospel, let me just use the Sunday Sunday gospel story, was probably a very fine man. There's nothing wrong with him. He followed all the commandments. It's not about the sins of commission. How about the sense of omission? Failing to do what you should do. Whoa, open that door. One guy comes to me, oh, by bishop, my God, you you humbly and you talk on the Eucharist, on on the reconciliation was so beautiful. I want to receive a grace of reconciliation from you. I have only one problem, and this is why I don't go to confession, because I don't have sense. Well, that's a sin number one. Let's keep talking. You know? Open the door of the failing to do what you should do. Whoa. Whoa. You know what? To do what you should do takes a sacrifice. And we don't do this because sacrifice for others, my God, it's not in the dictionary of so many people in America. I have to be honest with you. Really? Really? A suffering, you know, embrace the suffering. Don't run away from your suffering. Don't forget, Jesus will will take care of it. Did you hear this? Not a joke, it's a story about one lady going to to heaven, and and Peter greets her. Oh, ma'am, before you will, will, let let me just give you a little tour of heaven. He brings her to his golf cart. He travels with her around the beautiful hills of heaven, showing her all beautiful mansions. And in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. Let me tell you something. Some of them were beautiful mansions. Some of them were small houses. Some of them, like a bang bungalows. And the, I mean, beautiful dwelling places. 
And then brings to this gorgeous mansion. Holy smoke. And you know what? This mansion is for Joseph. Uh, you, 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 you driver, you know, who was with you and he died. For, oh, my God, my Joseph? My Joseph driver had the house? I can see, can't wait to see my house. Only a few, 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 few meters later, he stops the car and right on the front of a very small little bungalow, like a servant's house, and says, like, well, I'm, I'm, this is your dwelling place in heaven. Whoa, 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 wait, wait a second. Joseph, my guy, has this big mansion, and that's where I'm supposed to spend the rest of my life? You know what Peter said? Ma'am, I'm sorry, but that's I all what I could do with the materials you sent to me from earth to heaven. Do you know that by taking the suffering the way we should, you are building already your dwelling place in heaven? Oh my God! Who doesn't want to suffer just to make sure that we'll have a nice little house? I mean, not even little. Big house in heaven. Keep sending those logs and cement. You know what I'm saying? That... Ladies, that's what suffering is. That's what suffering is. That's what suffering is. We don't understand that. We try to escape and elevate suffering. It is Christ who suffers with us. See how important is that, that here element? It's very, very, very important. A sacrifice of the mass is something that we need to... Oh. Christ is present in his word. Jesus. Present in his word. How foolish you are, Jesus said to those in Emmaus. Not to know that Christ had to suffer, he said to them. And then, as you remember in the Gospel of Luke... He took every single piece of the scripture and explained to them every single passage that was referring to him. It was all about him. What does it tell you? Christ is present in the word of God. Christ is present in the scripture. Christ is actually not only present in the word of God. Christ is the word of God. You hear me? Hello. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you this. Did Jesus preach about love? Please say yes. yes. Is Jesus love? Yes. yes. Talking and being all together. Did Jesus preach about forgiveness? Yes. Is Jesus forgiveness? Yes. Talking and being all one. Did Jesus came to preach us about God's kingdom? Yes. Is Jesus the kingdom of God? Yes. Speaking and talking all at once. Jesus is everything what he said. You hear me? Yes. Everything what he said. Let me say this again. He's everything what he said. He's using my lips right now, but this is not me. These are not my words. His words that I am using, but he wants to say so you can hear, this is my body. It is not just a word. That's his body. Because he is everything what he says. You follow me? You follow me? Oh, 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 I didn't finish yet. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. And now, and now, you see this handsome Polish guy, not me, but a handsome Polish guy, (laughs) with a beautiful girl from Ireland, on their wedding day, you know what I'm saying? Giving each other a word, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health. And you know what happens, right? Blah, 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 blah. More than 50% of marriages in the Catholic Church end up with a divorce and separation? Tell me why. Because our words have no meaning. You hear me? We say things, but we don't mean it. We don't become what we say. You hear the problem? You see the problem? Hello? You see the problem? That's why we need to celebrate the Eucharist to become, to become what we celebrate, to become what we say, so the promises we will give to each other on the wedding day will have the meaning till the very end. Follow me? 
It's not enough just to, to choose to love someone on the wedding day, to be faithful to that choice, just like Jesus was faithful to the will of God on the, on, on the cross. You follow me? Welcome to the school of Jesus. Welcome to the beautiful of the Eucharist that I hope renew all of us. Needs to. Needs to. Because we come to the school of Jesus. Just think about the school of Jesus, guys. Don't we become what we hear? Don't we become what we read? Oh, come on, don't we send our, school, our children to smart schools so they can listen to smart teachers and read smart books and become as smart as their education? Hello? Yes. Are we with the product of our education? Yes. Let's make sure that we'll expose our ears and our eyes to a good stuff. Read good stuff. Not just trash novels. A good stuff. Welcome to the Word of God. Every Sunday. Every Sunday. Not just Word. It is Christ who is present in His Word. We become what we listen. Don't we? Hello? Yes. Don't we become who we are with? Yes. yes. How many children sometimes want to run away from home? But because they stay at home, thank God, they become who they are with, the beautiful family, right? Oh, listen, why do I have to give you this example? How many of you, how many of you, uh, uh, how many of you are Irish? Thank you. How many of you were born, born in Ireland? How many of you are Italian? How many of you were born in Italy? Why do you say that you're Irish, Italian, or Polish without being born there? Because you, you grew up in the household keeping the tradition. Don't we become who we are with? Yes. Bingo. Bingo. If we become who we are with, when two or three gather in my name on a Sunday, come to be with me, to become like me. Isn't liturgy beautiful? What a gift. Don't we become what we eat? My grandmother, oh my God, my grandmother, five years we didn't see each other. I want to say hello to her because we had such a great relationship. She was taking care of me when my mother and father was working, so we love each other. I mean, she was very special in my life. She didn't see me five years. Grandma, do you remember me? I mean, lady, do you remember me? She looks at me, nothing. Hint number one. Grandma, do you remember me? She didn't say anything. I said, well, maybe, you know, I look so good that she can, cannot even recognize me. <laughs> and I look very nice. After five years in America, hey, you look great. That's what I think, right? So finally, Grandma, hi, this is Angie. I came all the way from New York. Do you remember my loving grandmother? If Tennyson was saying to me, oh, my God, you look so good. I love you and I miss you. You know what she said? God, you're so fat. <laughs> I was 25, 25 pounds, uh, uh, you know, uh, older, uh, I have to say. But I would say, honey, if you have as many cheeseburgers and pizzas in New York... <laughs> As I did, you'll be worse than I am. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, think about this. We say to our children, listen, I, listen, we are different sizes. That's okay. It's okay to be different sizes, extra or triple extra, as long as you're healthy. You have to eat healthy to be healthy. Am I right? Yes. Don't we become what we eat? Yes. Welcome to the Eucharist. Come and eat. It's not a holy cookie. It is Christ. Eat him to become what you eat. Come to be with him to become who you're with. Come and listen to become who you listen because he's very much present in his world. That's what this document is talking about. He's opening his word, species, minister, and the people of God. When two or three gather in my name, I'm in their midst. This is a beautiful, beautiful document opening already our minds and hearts to see and to recognize his presence. Mm -hmm. Through our baptism, you know, we are called to active 
participation already. We are plants to Christ. I told you about it. Look at this. This is already from Sacred Phantom Consumium 14. I will encourage you to read it. But you know what I say? When you go to ancient basilicas, basilicas, you will see that at the, t- on the, on the, on the floor of the baptistry, usually, usually in all basilicas, you have mosaics or different combinations with fish and all different water creatures. You will think that you are stepping just like Jesus. No, please don't think that you are walking under the, above, above the waters. But you, know, you, you think that you are coming into the aquarium. We are plunged into Christ. As you know, fish cannot live without water. Right? Yes. From the time of our baptism, He is our water. We cannot breathe without Him. If you are baptized but don't care about Christian life, you are out of your real environment. You are not who you're supposed to be in the eyes of God. That's the risk you are taking in your life. This is why Eucharistic Revival is bringing everybody back. Let's come back to this aquarium, the water, baptismal water, without which we can see, simply cannot live. Mm-hmm. Look at this. Liturgical services are never private in nature. If we are in the world, I'm, I'm sorry. I hear. Listen, I know. I know. Don't crucify me. But this document is saying no private baptisms. Why would you have private baptism if we are the community of the church? This is why parishes are so destroyed. Do you know that in Poland, I, of course you know what I'm going to say, the best country in the world, <laughs> when they are on Saturday five weddings, five weddings, all of them at five evening mass on Saturday with all five weddings in the church during the same mass. If bride is or groom late for the, for the wedding, you're out of luck. <laughs> Parish Mass. All weddings, three, four, one, all of them in one. One celebration. Every sacrament is a sacrament that, that unifies us with the community. Maybe this is problem why so many beautiful weddings and very, very expensive weddings we have, private ones, because who cares about the rest of the parish where why don't you have those unknown people in the pews praying for you? Maybe with this exactly prayer of those unknown people, you'll be able to survive. You hear me? In my, in my history, of, listen, if I will ever write stories about my weddings, I had a wedding in Baldwin. That was actually my last wedding in the parish. One and two of them, bride and groom, after the reception, for which back then in 95, they pay $40,000. After the reception, they sat in separate limos, went separate ways, never saw each other again. Brother, that's why when people invite me, oh, Father, why don't you stop by? You know, you gave us such a wonderful uh, celebration. You, you they celebrated Mass so beautiful, beautiful family. Stop by for at least cocktail hour. No, no cocktail hours because when they start drinking, everybody comes to confession. <laughs> Like, you know, the guy has the drink in his mind. Oh, you know what, this beautiful wife is actually my, my third wife. I don't care. <laughs> you hear me? So I, I had the idea. I had the idea of going for a coffee after, you know, so this way you just jump in. I stopped going even for coffees. You know why? I was at my own wedding where the bride was feeding the groom with a cake. And you know, they were always good. The coffee is big. There is a whipped cream. So she took her hand and painted his face. He punched her. She was airborne on her own wedding. Oh, God is right. Believe it or not, yeah, that's what happens. What can I tell you? Maybe this is the secret why we have so many divorces and separation, because we have private weddings. 
all the sacraments are communal celebrations. We still have a lot of things to do. A lot of things to do. Please, do not think, don't, don't panic. It doesn't mean that I'm going to change all the rules or anybody's going to change the rules. We are going to have private weddings and baptisms, God knows for how long. But see the goal? See the blueprint? See the blueprint? Mm. That's why I make this in blue, just for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, what are we praying for? What are we praying for? What the Mass is truly all about? People sometimes ask themselves, listen, what, we, what, is, what is the fruit of the Mass? How to really measure that Mass, that we celebrate the Mass the right way? Unity. Unity. That's what Jesus prayed. You remember the Gospel of John? His final speech, farewell speech to his disciples? They all be one. If we are not one, or if we are not unified in the parish, then we don't have a fruits of the Eucharist. I don't have to tell you that we are not unified in the United States, do I? Hello. Oh my God, how divided we are. Here is the problem. So they can all be one. That's why we need to have the same point of focus. We need to kind of look at the same direction to be unified. And if you will ask me today, so Bishop, what is this? What is this? Eucharist. 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 Mass celebration. How to do this? To invite ourselves and invite all? I don't know. You tell me. We have three years to talk to each other. So tell me more. You know what I'm saying? Let's just keep going, guys, because we are, my God, I'm already being late. I promise I'll wrap up. Okay? Uh, everything, of course, listen to this. You know this. This document is already saying nothing can be changed. I'm sorry if priest is changing his mass so he can show you how cool he is or how smart he is or how good looking he is. Wrong, wrong, wrong. You cannot change the parts of the mass. You are not allowed to. Even bishop cannot change. Even the Holy Father cannot change. It's already controlled by this constitution. You cannot modify it without the permission of the Vatican. So sometimes there are kind of uh, uh, cultural additions, but they have to be approved by the Vatican, but priests cannot take the liberty. This is why, as you can see, I give you the example. Every single missile for the priest has those red instructions. Do this or do that. Oh, my God, I have to tell you. And believe me, I was experimenting in my life. Oh, let me just show you how cool I am. But, you know, follow the rubric. Follow the... There is 2,000 years of theology why we do the way we do. And trust me, everything is really absolutely amazing. When a priest, you know, who pays attention to priests even putting a little dip of water to the chalice? I mean, who pays attention? Priest then quietly says, by the mysteries of the water and wine, May, may we all be united. You know, the prayer is just simply about being united, just like water and one right now are united. To me, believe it or not, that, that's a simple gesture. And sometimes even priests keep it or they do, they do uh, you know, pre-fuel the, the charlies even before. No, this is exactly what the whole Mass is all about. Leave it there. Don't change it. Don't change it. You know, listen, who will ever think about this that... <laughs> Uh, listen, I don't do this because I'm trying to be aesthetic too much. I am going from like left to right around the altar. Look at this. Around the, the altar here, too much I go. Sometimes, you know, why not to go here this way? And the sacristy is here. But I have to tell you, when the instruction is saying that when priest adds, comes to the altar and he bows before the altar, he is going to the other side of the altar clockwise. Clockwise. I mean, who pays attention to this? Clockwise. Who cares? Did you hear what they said? Clock. Clockwise. What the clock is telling you? What the symbol of what? 
What? Of Clock is the symbol of what? Time. 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 Eucharist <clears throat> is time. Timeless. Eucharist is supposed to be timeless. The most beautiful thing you can do before going to Mass in preparation, leave you watch at home. I remember being <laughs> St. Agnes. There was a, you know, that, that lower, lower, uh, lower, lower, you know, whatever. There was a guy there. I have to tell you, so funny. I still don't know who he was. As soon as, as I finished reading the Gospel, as he was, and always sitting to the right, Ambo was here to the right. As soon as I finished the Gospel, He's, the very first gesture he always had. <laughs> oh, you know, Bishop Umas was very nice, but you know, uh, uh, I remember uh, Frank Maniscalco is a wonderful man. He was saying the Mass in St. Saint, Saint Thomas, the Apostle, and every golfer loved him. I remember going there saying the Mass. My Mass, listen to this, I had a Mass 35 minutes, Sunday Mass, not bad, right? No music, 35, right? Reasonable? You have no idea how furious they were that I had a nerve to extend the mass for five minutes because they have a tea time at the golf course. <laughs> how sad. Really. It is sad. It is sad. It is sad. Who counts it? Liturgy is a time. No clocks, no days, no hours. The time is suspended when we say the Mass. Simple gesture like this, like even walking clockwise, means everything. And you don't hear this word in prayer, this word walking clockwise, you know, it's here in those, I'm sorry, in those, uh, this clockwise, it's in the rubrics here. You know what I'm saying? And priest is being so cool, he's breaking all the rules, where now I am trying to, no, 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 Read them. They are there for a reason. You know what I'm saying? Not just simply to show the rhythm and we have to be enslaved, but there is a theology behind. Beautiful theology behind. That's kind of reform we are talking about here. How important that is. Mm -hmm. Eucharist is the beginning and the end. Sacrosanctum continuum end of who we are and who we can become. Helps us to breathe, to become who we're supposed to be in the eyes of God. St. Catherine of Siena, so beautiful, said, if people will become who they're supposed to be in the eyes of God, the world will be on fire of God's love. To me, we are on fire. One big one now we have in Ukraine. How many fires you see from bullets being released from the guns on our streets. How many fires of fights in our homes? And if people ask me why, why we have so many fires? Because people are not who they're supposed to be in the eyes of God. They don't make the fire of love, fire of wars and hatred. Ladies and gentlemen, Eucharist is our only salvation. It's the only, only way to redemption. Eucharist is the only opportunity for us to change something about our lives. And this is only in, in, in look at this, in only introductory chapter of, of, of the Constitution, which I will in, uh, encourage you to definitely read. People sometimes look at this here in Sacrosanctum Concilium already 47, we have a beautiful, what truly the Mass is. Is the memorial of Christ's resurrection and death, but hold on to this. Some people said, oh, so, you know, somebody saying that Mass is a sacrament of love, is it? Or somebody says Mass is a, is it sacrament of unity? It's a bond of charity? Yes, all that. All that, all in one package. All in one package. But let me tell you about this memorial. You know, we are talking here about a Jewish memorial. Uh, I don't know how many of you, uh, how many of you had a chance to celebrate Jewish Passover? Look at this. Jewish Passover is not really something new. It's a continuation of the Passover that took place originally in Egypt on the way to Promised Land. Continuation. It's the same event extended in time. Do you read me? Do you read me? 
That's what Eucharist is. Every Sunday, this is nothing really very new. This is actually a Holy Thursday, the Eucharist of Jesus Christ, celebrated with his disciples, extended in time. Welcome to 2022. The same Eucharist. This is the memorial that connects us with the past, celebrating the future, celebrating the present toward our future. Ah, beautiful. See, that's the kind of memorial, memorial. So the Vatican really wants us to be very much aware of that, this kind of theology. This theology which is truly, truly a, a beautiful mystery. Church, earnestly desirous that Christ, faithful, when present at this mystery of faith, should not be there as strangers or silent spectators. On the contrary, through a good understanding of rights, this is what this renewal is going to about, explaining the rights to us and prayers, they should take a part in the sacred action, be involved, participate with full conscience, conscious conscious of what they are doing with the devotion and full collaboration. They should be instructed by God's word, and by the table of the Lord's body, they should give thanks to God. Thanksgiving. Eucharistia is Thanksgiving. Saint, Saint, Saint Teresa of Avila beautifully said, think about this, the beginning and the end of our spiritual life, it's in thanksgiving to God for who we are and what we have. Welcome to the Eucharist. It's life. It's truly our life. You know, then also talks about, you know, other sacraments. And let me just maybe froze here for a while, guys, and ask you for questions because I know that you may have some questions. See, and this document also already grounds, grounds beautiful foundation for, for other sacraments, especially the catechumenate, which is truly a model. RCIA is truly a model. Because as you know, celebration of the right, it's also with a great education, with great formation that takes more than a year. You have to go through the whole cycle. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think we should definitely, in our renewal, modify it, uh, kind of follow, follow the example of RCA program to, to, to help ourselves. Confirmation is definitely, uh, definitely uh, uh, there is a need of confirmation to make a stronger relationship with, with, with our baptism, uh, and, and, and it's so very, very, very much needed. Very much needed. <laughs> God, confirmation. I remember, I remember being uh, I, at my graduate school. Listen to this. I will tell you what this new, new confirmation is about. I remember being late for my class, and it was uh, early in the morning. I didn't have a time for my double espresso, which I always took not to fall asleep. Uh, I'm sorry, I knew I have a rough day. All of a sudden, my professor said something about the Holy Spirit that was like, whoa, 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 whoa. It's a quote from uh, 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 Vladimir Lossky, an uh, Orthodox theologian. Uh, you know, you knew about this, and we all know about this, because there is a beautiful theology, for example, a prayer on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception that talks about this, that Holy Spirit comes always to us from our own future. (laughs) Every sacrament, listen, every sacrament has the moment of epiclesis. The Holy Spirit comes at every sacrament. There is a prayer for the Holy Spirit during which we participate. And our participation, He, Holy Spirit, comes to us, renews His coming to us at every Mass. As He came at our baptism, confirmation, even marriage right now, there is an addition. Beautiful prayers are being renewed right now. Marriage prayer, which has called epiclesis, praying to the Holy Spirit. He comes to us from our end. Do you know that each time you say, let's celebrate the Mass, the Holy Spirit comes from your future, knowing everything about your future? Everything. Knowing whether you are going to be 5, 10, 15 years from now, if you will stay with Jesus and take the Spirit with you, you are more than okay. However, if you participation at the Mass, I always say to the kids, it's like, whatever. Don't take me seriously. But Holy Spirit knows already how miserable you are going to be, for what reason you are going to cry in your life, if you will not take the Spirit with you. 
choices as ours. See, this is the kind of renewal of the sacrament I'm talking about. Even better, you will read the sacrament, you will read the Vatican Council documents, you also discover, I will ask you, listen, tell me, what is the most rewarding or what is the most grieving ministry in every parish? What would you say? What is the most like really grace-giving ministry or activity in the parish? Outreach. Hmm? Outreach. Outreach? Okay. I like that. Any other ideas? Bereavement. Hmm? Bereavement. Bereavement. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. Very, very important. Any others? Hmm? They're all important. I agree with that. It's beautiful answers, yes. But you know what? If you will lead, for example, this, you can see this about renewal of the sacrament of extreme unction, and which is now the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Are you ready? Nobody even think about this. Homebound. Homebound. Those who suffer because Christ suffers in them. They produce the graces, the same graces Christ produced, dying and suffering on the cross. See, that's the kind of renewal we are talking about. You know, to understand how much he takes the possession of our lives. And yes, as he did, introducing Paschal Mystery, he continues to celebrate the Eucharist in us, because of us, suffer in us and because of us, celebrating Holy Saturday in us and because of us, celebrating Easter and Pentecost in us and because of us, all in one package. Wow, beautiful. See, that's the kind of, you know, divine office, it's really all about, uh, about, uh, it's a beautiful actually introduction. I have to tell you to the divine office is also very, very important. What is the mass? Listen. Our prayers add nothing to God's greatness, but makes us more... Re- Let's put it this way. My prayer, my worship does not give any reverence to God, but makes us more reverent before Him. Liturgy of the... Listen to this. What the Mass is, it is actually a sacrifice of Jesus Christ in which we participate and add our lives to His act of worship given to God on the altar of the sacrifice which was the cross of Jesus 2,000 years ago, but now the altar of the sacrifice is right now during this Mass. Oh, beautiful theology. And if we only breathe this kind of theology, ladies and gentlemen, will be. As you know, liturgical year was also added and changed because we have right now a beautiful cycle of three years of Sunday, Sunday readings and the Gospel readings, uh, which basically is for the reason, for the reason of, of, of really... Of really uh, the reason is, is there's just only one, making Scripture and the fullness of Scripture and God's revelation truly available to us. Sacred music, once again, uh, is, is also uh, providing a, a great ground for, for maintaining the sacredness of the music. So all the rock and roll masses or, 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 or uh, you know, <laughs> heavy metal uh, rock masses, uh, you have to be very careful how to do it. It's, it's just simply not to lose uh, the, the, the sacredness of the celebration and of the event. Very briefly, I will encourage you to take a look at this, at this, sac- uh, this beautiful document that Holy Father really released just this year, Desiderio Desiderio Ravi, uh, a beautiful reflection based exactly on the reform. I just mentioned this to you. Holy Father really invites all of us to a great renewal and great reform of our, of our uh, liturgy by just simply liturgical catechesis, which you guys are already doing and doing fine, to rebuild the communion. Let me just skip this to open for, for, for questions through our participation. But look at this. He talks very specifically in this document, most of all about liturgical formation. What? To be form, for, and by liturgy. Our liturgical renewal is to prepare ourselves for a better celebration, but also it is for us to engage with the Eucharist so much so that what we experience there and have the encounter with Jesus Christ, we are being formed 
with what celebrate or who we celebrate, Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. A beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, kind of touch that the Holy Father uh, has so we can all become by our lives uh, a beautiful song, a song of glory to God, because that's exactly what our creation is all about. That's exactly what our Christian life is all about. Ladies and gentlemen, just to make the icing on the cake, I would just like to tell you that already functioning right now is this email address. Revival at the RVC. Revival at the RVC. If you have any questions or if you would like to share any stories or any suggestions how we can do and renew ourselves eucharistically, or if you are looking for the calendar of events, if you would like to be on any kind of mailing list, don't forget to be engaged and be always in touch with this email address. Revival at the RVC, it's already working, it's already functioning, and this is the platform available to all priests, all deacons, and all the faithful, so please do engage. With any questions and comments you would like to ask me personally, and please don't hesitate, bishop bp.andre.z, don't forget about that, that right after bp, and andre.z at gmail.com. That's it. <laughs> That's it. I'm done. Uh, as you can see, there is more material, but I knew that, you know, when I'm talking, uh, uh, looking at you, even comments and faces, I'm going to spend more time on this and this and that. But, of course, want to open myself to, myself to any comments and questions that you may have. And what? Communion. Communion, okay. And, and what I mean by communion is communion with the, um, the magisterium of the church, etc. And what comes first and what follows what? Because I think that, that they, there's a tension there. Definitely Eucharist. Eucharist is first and magisterium only serves the Eucharist. You know, magisterium is the one, a structure, structure that is definitely responsible for maintaining a proper celebration. You know, once again, but uh, we have to keep ourselves, what do we understand by the Eucharist? If the Eucharist is really a Jesus Christ, so think about this, he's definitely first, not magisterium. Well, what I mean by it a little more deeply is when we're trying to bring people in, and they may not be in communion with the, the magisterium of the church, is the Eucharist, is the hope and prayer that the Eucharist is going to bring them in or do we need to seek a, you know, more of a communion first in order for people to better comprehend that the Eucharist is a No, I know, you're right. You're, you're right. I mean, you can, can, you, they, they should go all together. You know, Eucharist is already a communion. My point is, if you are going to talk about your communion first, or let's say take care of the, the dy dynamics of communion without having a core, then it's social club. I'm sorry, it's a social club. It's a social club. You know what I'm saying? Therefore, but Eucharist without communion, it's impossible when two or three gather in my name. Think about this. When Jesus comes to see his disciples after his suffering and death, to let them know that he's not dead, that he's still alive, how he comes to them? When they are together. When they are together. Read, huh, read the Gospel of Luke, the story to Emmaus. As they come to tell the, ele the rest of them what happened to them, they also hear that at the same time Jesus appeared to Peter and others. Can Jesus be at the same time in different places at different time? Can he? Please say yes, absolutely. So tell me how come when he went to visit the ten of them and Thomas was probably drinking heavily in Jerusalem, Jesus didn't appear to him at the same time. Tell me how. Waiting for Thomas to be with the rest of them. Communion. Communion. We have to be together to have a true sense of the Eucharist. They complement each other. They work together. Eucharist is communion. Communion is the Eucharist. Father John will tell you more about the Eucharist that makes the church, and church makes the Eucharist. Church communion meaning. Uh, there is a beautiful book. I hope that Father John maybe will, uh, will uh, bring uh, a, a nice speaker who will, who will tell you about these incredible mysteries. But, you know, they, they, they go together. You know, how? Well, you know, will that happen? I am not a prophet, but that's exactly what I'm praying for. 
you know, I don't know the answer really how long it will take us there, but this is the goal. But this is the goal, absolutely. Good point, good question. Any other question, comments? Thank you. You're so anxious to go home already, right? <laughs> You asked for a comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. Any comments or questions? I think, you know, I hope that you feel this is a very, very exciting time. It's, it's for all of us. Really, I mean, even for the bishop's time of renewal, for the priest's time of renewal, for deacon, for all of us, a great time of renewal. And what is the best way? We go to the sources. And this is the source of all the sources. Every single thing, every single thing, what church said after the Second Vatican Council, has its own blueprints in the documents that you are going to study. That's why I want to give a compliment to Father John for his idea or whatever, whoever created this idea for you guys to take a look at those documents, which is a blueprint uh, for, for uh, every single document and every single effort and every single kind of I I initiative that we take in the church uh, after uh, 1962. Thank you. Uh, so I know it's a sacrifice of your time as well as the bishop mentioned, just as a little commercial. Um, we're mentioning the documents themselves, they're all online. But this is from the Word on Fire, Bishop Baron. It's a good resource because it has uh, not only the documents, but different commentaries on them, whether it's from Bishop Baron himself or even some of the post conciliar popes, Benedict, John Paul II, Francis, um, in their meditations on documents. So we hope you will join us. Next Monday, uh, Dr. Michael Bluetown from St. Joseph Seminary will be with us. Um, and also, separate from our kind of discovery of these documents or rediscovery, um, on Friday there's an invitation to all the gentlemen of the parish. There will be a holy house so we can, we can be in the presence of the real presence of Jesus himself. Um, and Alex Basil from Kellenberg will be here for that. And then there will be a ladies' holy hour in November. Um, and of course, most especially every time we gather, for the celebration of the Eucharist, where we literally live and embody everything that the bishop shared with us. So we look forward to seeing you, whether it's Friday, next Monday, but most especially, most importantly, at the altar at Mass. Have a great night. And we'll see you soon. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you, John. Thank you. That's a good book.